Welcome back to the Another Snack Podcast to a, let's say, stellar episode this time. I'm your host, Fabian Ahlefeld, and today we're venturing into the final frontier with a space roundtable featuring a all-star panel. And it's been almost a year since we talked about space on this podcast. We had Paul Gradle on the show some time ago. And Paul, and I'll introduce him in a second again, we came up with this idea of a space roundtable. So here we are, and joining us today are, of course, Paul Gradle. He's uh, a principal engineer at NASA. Ileana Fu, industry manager for aerospace and medical at Trump and X-Relativity Space at SpaceX. We have Advenitz Makaya. He's an advanced manufacturing engineer at the European Space Agency. And last but not least, Miles Keeper. He's the additive manufacturing manager at Rocket Lab. And it is great timing for such an episode. Yesterday, SpaceX was able to reach orbital velocity with its latest Starship launch. It also provided us with really beautiful imagery of, of its reentry. Rocket Lab also just had its 45th launch a few days ago. I think March 12th, my birthday, with two additional launches planned for this year. And last month, the first metal 3D printer was installed on the ISS. So it's a great time to have this panel. Space and additive manufacturing are accelerating rapidly. And therefore, without further ado, let's get started. Paul, Ileana, Advenida Miles, welcome to Additive Snack. Thanks for having us. All right, let's dive right into the core of this interface of space and, and additive manufacturing. And we'll start a bit high level and then make our way deeper and deeper into the core of the technology. But Miles, since you're at Rocket Lab and you have such a good overview of the state of the industry, could you help us understand a little bit more what is the current state of additive manufacturing in space and how critical is it actually for human space exploration uh, in the industry. Yeah, yeah, I could take a stab at that for sure. I think probably a couple of us in here who have a, a good or maybe a bit of a different perspective on this as well. But I think that additive manufacturing, very critical application in the space industry, um, especially for considering technologies like laser powder bed fusion, um, various forms of DED, um, and then even some polymer printing. There's people printing patterns for investment castings and things like that. I think it's, that's also really important and often overlooked. It opens a lot of doors. Uh, it allows us to, to fail fast so we can iterate really quickly with, with technologies like powder bit fusion or DED, where we can, we don't have to spend years going through analysis and making sure that we have a design finalized before we actually jump into making parts. There's often times that we can build up various different flavors of the same part before going into a testing campaign and have all those ready. And, and that's really good. It, it's that the barrier of entry into getting parts made is a little bit lower. So there's big, there's like really big benefits in, in everything from part consolidation to geometric freedom that you can get with some of these uh, technologies. For thinking about laser powder bit fusion, for instance, this opens up a whole bunch of possibilities for things like region channels and mass optimization that you just don't have with other technologies. Yeah. And then just shrinking that length of the supply chain, which is related to this rapid iteration thing as well. We don't have to, a part that maybe used to go through a hundred different pieces that were installed into one pair part that had to go through all these different types of post processes can now be boiled down into monolithic parts. So each process that you take out of that manufacturing value stream is is just another process that you don't have to worry about um, something going wrong in. So making that a lot shorter is very helpful. And then the whole material side, and I think we'll probably get into that in a little bit later, but if we're looking at uh, laser powder bit fusion again, in particular, the, the material space opens up so much. You can do things that just weren't possible with other manufacturing methods in the past. Yeah, I think it plays an absolutely critical role, especially for these new space companies that are coming up who need to get products to market quickly and, and test quickly. Rocket development's extremely expensive. Shortening that time span is really important in order for people to have a shot at surviving. Yeah, it's interesting. Usually if we engage with industries, they oftentimes either look at the performance aspect of additive manufacturing, which is valuable to an organization. So complex designs, et cetera, or they look at the supply chain aspects as mainly for spare parts, but 
I think one of the reasons why additive is so critical to the space industry is because both aspects are so critical to its success. Ileana, you've experienced the space industry from various different angles, from SpaceX to, to also now being at the Trump at a machine manufacturer. So you've seen, I've seen all a aspects and facets of it. From your perspective, what are really today the top five applications that are additively manufactured for space missions today? Yeah, it's a really interesting statement and totally agree with everything that Miles just listed for the advantages of using AM as a tool. I think if you're talking about laser-based processes, obviously laser powder bed fusion and laser DED are very interesting techniques, but there's also laser DED with wire that's becoming even more interesting. And we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about that because I don't think we have too many uh, good examples of that. And just want to say there is also the WAM process, the wire arc additive and also electron beam that we don't spend a lot of time talking about because um, everyone really talks about laser powder bit fusion as probably the most numerous examples of applications today. And they can be anything from small satellite thrusters to antenna to actual engine parts. You have your injector and your nozzle parts as well. Small structures or large structures, anything that will fit inside a powder bed machine are things that people have investigated. So all of those things are of interest. What we're seeing now, though, are even larger structures that don't fit inside a powder bed machine, like the very large nozzle skirts. So that's where things like DED and preform additive manufacturing is coming more into play. So you start seeing more of those examples as we go on. But yes, it's a great tool. But it's not the only tool. And sometimes we just need to be aware that it isn't the right answer for that particular application. Or sometimes the thing that you want to print isn't even available in that raw material. So just something to think about. That's a good point. And I think we should definitely touch on those limitations, uh, maybe as we go further into depth throughout this discussion, especially as we scale up and we're planning more and more launches like, like Rocket Lab is. Maybe Paul, from your perspective, anything to add on these, these statements? I, I think it's a great point that don't use additive unless you have to. And I think one thing that has been challenging is training some of the new engineers that were brought up in this digital world, right? And always having access to a 3D printer. They didn't necessarily struggle through making a combustion chamber the old way with plating and brazing and failing chambers through the manufacturing process and in high scrap rates. So I do think there's a bit of education that we need to do there and just say that not everything fits into this additive box per se, that there's a lot of traditional manufacturing out there that hasn't gone away. There's still a lot of advancements there. And I do think that by times you're not necessarily going to get the cost advantage if you're trading it improperly, because you can do a lot of great things with machining. But additive is a good supplement to that. I, I can't think of any engine or application out there where you're not going to use a mix of traditional manufacturing and additive manufacturing. And Miles and Eliana said, taking advantage of the complexity of additive, part consolidation, new materials that we couldn't make with previous methods or really difficult to manufacturing methods. Again, going back to that traditional manufacturing perspective, if you haven't gotten yelled at your machinist by bringing a piece of Inconel to them and then telling you how difficult it's going to be to do that, maybe, maybe you need to learn that, that lesson before you uh, venture into additive. Um, but I think one of the big things aside from that too is maybe you don't use additive manufacturing in your production. Maybe use it just during your prototyping, like Miles said, during that design fail fix cycle. And I can iterate very quickly on that. And then when I do high volume production, maybe I switch over to a more traditional process. So again, we can use the tools in front of us to speed that up because traditionally when we've been doing rocket engine development, it can be five to seven years for some of these very large engines. And sometimes you're waiting on parts or forgings, maybe six months or a year. Parts might be a couple of years on that. 
And that's just time that you're sitting waiting on that. So there's a huge opportunity, like Eliana and, and Miles stated, we're using additive in different parts of the life cycle. It's interesting. We always talk about how do we educate engineers about additive manufacturing? And now you're bringing, how do we unteach additive manufacturing <laughs> to the next generation? That's uh, okay. That's an interesting uh, perspective. I never thought about that, but it's true. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Anvinit? From a European space agency perspective, what does the adoption of additive look like in the European region and, and its players? So I think uh, additive as in the US or other part of the world is slowly going away from high base uh, where it was full. It was nice to try things and we promised a little bit too much. Uh, and there's a, a lot of maturity now being gained, as Paul explained. You fail. You figure out how hard it is, and then you start to understand where it really helps and where it's just uh, super close. So that's what we're seeing in Europe. We are moving away slowly towards more primary structures, more critical parts as opposed to brackets and things like that, where you get some benefits from light weighting, etc., but where it's not really critical. As I would say as the maturity is increasing, the challenges are understood. We are evolving towards, I would say, more core parts of the developments. So I think it's a great time to be in, in additive because we are really trying to pinpoint where it can add value as opposed to doing additive for doing additive. Yeah, it's a good point. I'm glad that it is moving out of the hype curve, right? I think uh, it benefits everyone from OEMs to users to contract manufacturers to really have realistic expectations on on the other end. And also what comes with, with the hype cycle is really that we were, we're moving into what you said, maturity of the technology. And I think here materials play, play a huge role, right? If you look at the, the history of at least metal additive manufacturing, except for the early days where we really just mixed in bronze with a steel to be able to melt that material. We then really moved into how do we copy conventional manufacturing materials in, in the additive space to accelerate adoption. We're now entering a space where new materials are being unlocked by additive manufacturing. I think materials that are crucial for AM expansion, GRCOP42 is a great example. Liana, you mentioned it even in our previous conversations. So I'm curious to hear, maybe starting uh, with you, Paul, what are what materials are currently key to space applications, but also where do we see some gaps that we can fill with innovative materials and alloys that can really also accelerate space? Yeah, so I think materials is probably one of the areas that I'm most excited about in additive. For decades, we've been using materials that have worked, uh, but we've always wanted performance improvements. We wanted materials at higher temperatures, higher strength, some of these unique environments in hydrogen and oxygen, high pressure, high temperature. And I think the early days of additive, right? You had two or three materials. It's like you needed to make titanium or aluminum silicon 10 meg or stainless 316 work in your application. Now we've really expanded that materials database, but we're still very much aligned with some of the traditional materials, right? We've developed all the ink canals and the haynes. There's a lot of advancements in aluminum, but still have some lineage to traditional manufacturing. I think in the last couple of years, we've really seen this onset of everybody open their eyes saying, wow, we can make materials that we could never make before with additive. GRCOP alloys, the copper chrome niobium are one example. I wouldn't say the best example, but we can make them traditionally, but they were very difficult. It was very long lead for those materials. They started out as a powder form and then we'd have to hip consolidate them or convert them to a forging eventually. Since I have that powder, I can go direct in the additive process. So it's almost like it was made for additive manufacturing prints really well, then that opened us up to these different types of materials we can do, d even different classes of materials. So NASA has been involved in developing NASA HR1, which is a hydrogen resistant iron nickel based material, which again, it was very difficult to make traditionally and additive. It's been a breeze. It 
builds beautifully. We've advanced new classes of materials, for instance, the GRX 810, which is in ODS, Oxide Dispersion Strength of Material, which you really couldn't make with traditional methods. And again, with additives, it's very simple to go advance these materials. I think it's not just about the availability of the materials, but the ability to iterate on these as well. So with traditional material development and material science, we'd have to go through and cast it and forge it and it would be six months or a year before we would get some initial samples. Now we can go through iterations using some of the thermal calculation softwares and, and run two to 5,000 iterations to figure out like, is this even going to be weldable before we get into a machine? And what phases am I forming? Is this the elements in there, they're going to play together nicely. So we can do that and then we can get powder pretty quickly and we can be in a machine in a matter of weeks or months. And then you can do this creation. So it sped up the materials engineering process side of this too. And I would imagine in 10 years or 20 years that we're probably not using the same materials and additive that we are today. There's a few of them that will probably remain, but I expect a lot of new materials to mature over time. And we're just going to see the advantages of that and adopt those uh, long term. Yeah, Fabian, I got a couple more examples to go alongside GR Cobb. Perfect one is C103, which traditionally has been extremely expensive to source in North America. Very difficult. Only one mill produced that from a raw ESR melting process to then rolling that to sheet, which is very limited because they only had one mill that's only 25 inches wide. And then you'd have to water jet cut those and then there would be a lot of dangers associated with very sharp edges. So then materials handling became an issue. And then not only that, but TIG or EB welding and then doing some suicide coating. So if you could take that material, erase that whole manufacturing process and just print that, obviously you have to get the powder first, but you would decrease a lot of not just lean time, but also personnel materials handling risks that that material also that, that contributed to a huge part of that cost. And now you say, AM, hey, what a great tool. We can just go to but those very small printed parts or even larger parts. So that's a great example where AM is also changing the way we manufacture the parts from the raw material side. Another one would be high strength aluminium, what would be considered high strength for aluminium as opposed to something like steel or titanium, for example. But think about the 6061 variants that have now very affordable strengthening mechanisms. So it's something like a 6061 RAM 2, where as opposed to those other traditional materials where the strengthening mechanism is a rare earth that's in a very only comes from one mine in a region which could be essentially a conflict region. Why not reduce that risk in the supply chain and also decrease the cost? So there are a multitude more materials that could go on. Let's say gamma titanium aluminides, which in the titanium industry we've been trying to make for about 40 years and haven't been able to successfully do it other than PAM. Now you can 3D print those. So those are all examples of where the 3D printing process has removed all those manufacturing steps in the traditional world. And also those other risks and things that come along with that. Yeah, very interesting. And without trying to derail this conversation too far, but just a few months ago, I read an article about DeepMind, which launched a project to really use AI to investigate different material combinations and alloys that have never been tried before. And to, to Paul's point, using additive for fast iterations and validating some of these materials seems to be very interesting to me. Does anybody have some thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that Paul and Orlando just hit the nail right on the head with all that. Honestly, I think the big thing that was touched on was like the different strengthening mechanisms that are available when using additives. Paul talked about GRX 810, great example of an oxide dispersion strength and ally. There's other people doing printing alloys that in the rock form have a much different microstructure because of the 
because of the different manufacturing process that the raw material is made with. But when they print it, because of that rapid cooling, they're seeing carbide dispersion strengthening being through the parts too. So depending on the material, you could add things to it that are actually favorable for the manufacturing process, that rapid melting and solidification. And yeah, these, these strengthening mechanisms are, are only possible with the additive process. Um, I think there's a lot of traditional materials that people are, are comfortable with, but a lot of those materials have their chemistries tailored for the way that the rot material is manufactured. And that's not always favorable for the additive manufacturing process. I think what Paul was talking about in the next 10 years or so, there's going to be a whole different class of alloys that people are using for more specific applications. And yeah, the alloy development space is just, it, it's super exciting, right? Because you're not really bound to these, these past fillers that you'd have to put in chemistry for the manufacturing processes. You could tailor the chemistry for the additive manufacturing process and make an alloy that's much more, you can print at higher throughput rates. You can get further away from needing a bunch of post-processing after printing. So you can reduce the amount of heat treating that's required compared to traditional alloys and things like that. So I think as the additive technology starts to mature, the next frontier is the material side that kind of favors the technology. Yeah, I, I would say the revolution in the material side is, is very much uh, happening. You talked about DeepMind and uh, Paul talked about using uh, computational tools. Uh, there's a growing field called ICME, Integrated Computational Materials Engineering. Uh, which is about developing modeling tools to understand what's happening to the microstructure at different level from atomic to, to component level. Uh, so multiphysics, et cetera, that's being applied more and more to, to understand the processes and also to understand new materials. Artificial intelligence is coming right on point to, to add machine learning capabilities to these ICME tools. And we are also seeing new materials like high entropy alloys, for example, mm -hmm. who can expand the strength and the ductility of, of metallic materials at the same time. Metallic glasses have been around for a while. So all this convergence of in, in improving the capabilities of computational tools and also new chemical recipes for metallic materials are right on point for, for uh, being harnessed by, by additive manufacturing. And the one challenge I see with this though, is we develop these new materials and then the bar keeps getting set higher. You say, Hey, we can go develop this material and we can run it at uh, 1100 C for 5,000 hours. And then a customer comes in and says, that's great. I want 10,000 up. But trying to manage some of the expectations of the materials development is a bit challenging too, because you have this wide open space. It's like, you can do anything you want. Uh, on this, but, th but there's still definitely limitations that we need to consider. And I think one of the things that is exciting about the material development, but challenging is now we have a new material, right? We need to go characterize that material and make sure that it's safe for human space flight in, in other applications. Yeah. What does that mean for you guys, Miles, as a, as a manufacturer? all of these materials that promise interesting applications. How do you build that into your roadmap? Are there certain applications that you see being enabled by these specific alloys? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the, the way we treat it is we'll start with something like a traditional alloy that has a lot of like heresy. There's a lot of information that exists about a material. So we'll start with something that we know and that there's a bunch of data on, but so. If we think about the Archimedes engine, the Archimedes engine that we're building right now to power our next rocket, Neutron, it's a, it's an Oxrich stage combustion cycle, very challenging environment, high pressure, high temperature oxygen really likes to, to turn a lot of robust metals into glorified firewood. It'll just burn in that environment. So we're, we're starting with a, with a material that we know works in that environment, but we're actively working on developing alloys in the background that are just better suited for that environment and better suited for the printing process in particular. Yeah, that's the way we handle it. Go with a known thing up front to buy down a little bit of risk. And then in the background, start collecting as much data as possible until you're comfortable with switching over to a new novel alloy. Because like Paul said, characterizing an alloy is, <clears throat> is much more than running some tensile tests and saying, oh, look, I got great tensile properties. Like, let's go throw that into this multi-million dollar machine and, and hope for the best. It's, there's, there's a lot of work that goes into the characterization. Yeah, it's the way we approach it. 
start with something now and then develop in the background of parallel. Okay, interesting. So from a European Space Agency perspective, what are current application development projects that you can talk about that leverage additive manufacturing for new, possibly today unseen applications? We are, yeah, as I say, moving from secondary structures to more primary structures. Some of our rockets, for example, IAM-5 already had the primary structures in it. But on the satellite side, we are looking at core structural parts of the satellites. We are doing a lot as well in functional materials, for example, an RF application where additive is really responding to the challenges in terms of complexity of internal channels, etc. Uh, so at the same time, broadening the range of applications and also moving towards critical parts. And there is also an area which is very much emerging, which we are looking at more and more is manufacturing in space. So moving from manufacturing something on Earth, sticking it as much as we can within a fairing and then launching it to manufacturing directly in space. So this has different advantages. You are not limited by the size of the fairing, so you can make very large antenna to in increase the data throughput, very large solar arrays to increase the power per, per, per launch, basically the power that you your payload is, is accessing, and also you can build lighter structures because they don't have to go through the launch space. Other applications in exploration, making on-demand manufacturing of hardware to limit the, the logistics, the resupply logistics. Uh, so we are developing the technical, technological building blocks to make that happen. And that can be illustrated by the first meta printer, which we launched a few weeks ago, which is uh, being commissioned at the moment. So. Yes, manufacturing in space you know, is a bit of a dream at the moment, uh, but if you are slowly establishing the building blocks, maturing them, slowly it will become a reality, just as additive 40 years ago was a bit of a dream, and now it's, it's flying in a number of spacecraft. Yeah, I could even imagine that a space environment is very interesting for material properties. You have uh, zero oxygen out there if you were produced outside of the space station. Is that also something that is being investigated up there? Absolutely. You saw the the first flight of uh, Varda Space, which is a U.S. company who is developing space factories, basically. Uh, so there is a, a growing interest in commercial ventures, which would manufacture things at a level of quality that you cannot achieve uh, on Earth, and then sell them at a high premium uh, to us. So that's also an area that's very much uh, in, in progress. Very interesting. How about from your perspective, Paul, what are some innovative applications that, that you guys are working on at the moment? I, I think we're still heavily focused on launch vehicles propulsion systems is we've been doing it for 12 years or, or greater on that, but the industry is still trying to wrap their heads around, how do we do this repeatedly? How do we do it safely? What are the standards and the expectations of what these parts need to meet? And NASA has been central on developing some of the specifications, the standards, the NASA 6030 and 6033 are additive manufacturing for human spaceflight. You know, we talk a lot about in there the process control, which is like the foundational control and the part production control on that. And that's probably the most common question that we get moving forward is like, what do I need to follow? Um, it is part of this. And like Miles was alluding to that you have to know your process really well, right? I need to know my, my parameter box, but I also need to know what happens when I have off nominal parameters in that when I start to change my laser power or my scan speed a little bit, when does the material go bad? And that is a huge challenge because there's so many different parameters, all the different feedstocks, the inputs, the process uh, on that. So where am I really sensitive uh, on that? And I think that's one thing that's, that will help us push forward is for the industry to get a better understanding of the process itself. And then once I do some of that initial sensitivity studies, 
Then I go into the heat treatment aspect of this is I need to understand how the material is going to respond to these different heat treatments. Do I need to do HIP? Am I not doing HIP? Stress relief, solution aging, that every material has a different process that I'm going through. And I think there's a, a lack of understanding in a sense uh, on this as well. And with additivity, it gives you more complex because I have different sections on the part where one might be thicker and one might be thinner. I have a different microstructure that might respond differently during heat treatment. One thing that I often say is that a lot of us that weren't metallurgists by trade have had to learn that aspect uh, of it. And I have a lot more respect now for Eliana and, and folks that were trained in, in material science. Um, because we all appreciate that now and, and we understand the material science pyramid and what you've been trying to tell us for years about my process is going to control my microstructure, which is going to properties. So I think there's still a lot of education and understanding around that to move forward. I mean, we still see some resistance to additives where we have been making parts for many decades with the traditional process or saying, Hey, now I can go make this part a lot faster and I can do it a lot cheaper, but there's hesitancy there. It's, I need to do the cost trade and the risk associated with implementing a new parts that may not perform the same uh, on that. So some of those barriers uh, to adoption, but I think we're starting to look at new applications, tanks, even some of the cryogenic fluid management, where we need to put some of these tanks in orbit and you need to keep your fuel cold for a really long time without boil off. And there's new applications of additive that we could see in that where I'm using a series of regen channels to make these very complex, large structures. Like Advanit had mentioned, in space manufacturing is a significant area of growth, particularly for NASA. We want to be building parts, not only in orbit, but when we return to the moon and, and go to Mars, we're looking at how do we go build parts and launch pads and power plants in the infrastructure to sustain presence on the moon. So now we're using the in-situ resources, the lunar dust to go create parts from it and extract different elements from that to, to make in-situ additive manufacturing work. And obviously we don't know, we don't know yet. We're trying to do the early experiments on that. We're really excited about the potential of that. And then that of course brings a question too. It's okay. Now I'm building parts in space. How do I make sure that those parts are safe? How do I qualify those parts in, in space? So I think a lot of it comes back to some of that foundational control. What are my requirements? What do I need to meet? And one thing that we always like to say about the NASA specifications is they're tailorable. They're there is a guideline. You don't have to follow every single step on this. If you're not required contractually to adhere to it. So use it as a guideline and, and adjust it. But I think again, having that basic understanding of the process, who is responsible for what, how am I going to approve that? Who is the approving organization? That's a lot of the questions that we need to be asking uh, on it. And I think one thing that we've seen with the shift from additive is we've always done a lot of this qualification with traditional manufacturing, but now everybody wants to go really fast with additive. So they expect the qualification process to go really fast as well. So I think education again, in, in that area is important. Yeah, very interesting points. And you mentioned space is accelerating, like I mentioned in the beginning, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Miles, but yeah, just you guys launched 45 missions so far, but have 22 scheduled for this year. So that's, it's a very rapid growth curve that also requires uh, manufacturing to, to accelerate quite quickly. So. Eliana, maybe asking you that question, you, like we mentioned, have experience from relativity to SpaceX, and now you are at a very established machine manufacturer at Trump that really understands the whole manufacturing process chain, not just additive. How do you see additive keeping up with that acceleration of manufacturing? And do you see some gaps or opportunities there? 
if you're talking about in terms of learning from all the other industries and manufacturing process that are currently going on, I think it's like a, a loop. So yes, absolutely, you can learn from it. And this also ties into what Paul was saying before about what a future needs in space will be. So for example, you mentioned if we go to explore more planetary bodies like the moon and other Mars and future maybe asteroids and so on, you can imagine a world where people are going to need structures to live in. They're going to need mobile labs. How do you construct those? How do you make those? You can actually take learnings from what we're doing on Earth now. So in a completely unrelated industry, which you may not pay attention to, people are 3D printing houses. Okay, they're printing concrete, so it's not quite the same material, but you could extend that or you could imagine you could extend that to Lunar Regulus. Has anyone done that? Maybe they have and they're not sharing the results. But that's part of where that learning comes from. The same thing with we saw a 3D printed bridge in Amsterdam. So you know that the bridge has got to be safe enough for people to walk on and carry their load. And maybe a van drives across it a couple of times a day or something like that. So all of those learnings, those learning opportunities of what we're doing on Earth in what you would think of completely unrelated applications, they could be transferable when you have the key points or the critical maybe failure mechanisms or maybe that bridge is going to break one day or maybe a 3D printed house develops some cracking issues or some moisture or humidity issues. Those are learnings that you can take with you as you do your space exploration. So I think that even though they're not things that we're directly working on, we should all be keeping an awareness of that and re remarking that as a point in the sand, someone's 3D printed a house. Someone's 3D printed a bridge. These are huge structures, but there are structures that humans, as a, a, a human race, that we need. We're going to need somewhere to live. We're going to need somewhere to traverse canyons and things like that in the future. I don't know what they look like, or maybe they're frozen rivers on Mars or something like that that we haven't discovered yet. But all those things, you have to keep an open mind with that. Now, I know you're laughing. But it's not quite science fiction. It's science fiction of today, but it will be science sucked 20 years from now, 10 years from now. When people said, oh, I saw, I was watching uh, some huge Star Trek fan and I happened to watch um, an episode of Picard. Okay. It's not really a great show, but they were 3D printing something. I was like, 3D printing in, in Star Trek now. Actually, that's the wrong technology because when you use charts, the replicator is based on transporter technology. But anyway, I'm not going to nitpick that. The point is, it's in 3D printing or additive is in the consciousness. People know what it is. Uh, even lay people, they're not scared of it. When I go to the mall and I wear my Adidas shoes, they all 3D printed shoes. They've heard something about it. They've seen oh, 3D printed basketball that has, you don't need to pump it. So all these things that you think are in completely unrelated, they're all little steps that help us to get to where we're going. Yeah, really good points. We're maybe further than we think we are. We're quite critical us being in the additive manufacturing space of ourselves, but maybe we underestimate the advancements that we've done in the past 10 to 20 years. Yeah, really good points. Miles, from, from a manufacturer's perspective, like I mentioned, 22 launches scheduled this year. How many launches after that and after that? What does that growth curve look like and how are you keeping up with that manufacturing demand? Yeah. So yeah, this year's 22 plan, not really at liberty about talking about future kind of outlook and stuff. That's one of my only rules is of talking as a publicly traded company. But yeah, this, the scalability of additives is really fantastic, right? Because it's we're always targeting max utilization rates on machines. We're buying expensive machines. Nearly half the price of the part comes from the machine depreciation that's being cooked into that part that you're printing. We're always targeting 85% plus kind of utilization rates on our machines just to, so that we're being as economic as possible with them. But the good thing is that makes us very strategic about what parts go on what machines and how many we could get from an output perspective on each machine. Scaling becomes pretty easy at that point. If you have a facility that's ready and has space for a machine and has everything 
enough air, enough argon, enough HVAC capacity and all that. It's, it's a matter of some capital and adding another machine in as you need to scale. Yeah. So that's the big thing for us. I think we're producing a lot this year. You mentioned 22 launches. That means that at minimum, we need to build 220 engines for the Rutherford or for electrons. So we need to build 220 Rutherford engines minimum. So yeah, realistically, it's probably going to be like closer to 230, 250. So keeping that humming along in the background while balancing all of the Archimedes development is a real fun thing. But now we're at the, the same point of Archimedes where we're maxi- maximizing all the machines utilizations there and trying to figure out what parts are actually being printed long-term versus parts that we're, we're iter- reiterating on now that might be a casting later on. How do we balance that? How do we, we're learning at which knobs we need to turn once that scaling opportunity comes. Yeah, that's how we handle that. We take a step back and really look at it holistically. And it's always about the maximization of utilization. Now, machines are expensive, so you don't want them just sitting there and having a bunch of machines for the sake of having a bunch of machines. It's all about running efficiently. And and, uh, yeah. No, thanks for sharing that. That's very helpful to understand where the industry is going and how you guys are preparing for growth. Just keeping a pulse on the industry, right? Because I think Paul talks about materials, how... Oh, I have this material that can operate at a thousand degrees Celsius. And someone says, oh, I want it 10,000. It's like people always want more. And I think the same could be said about machines. People always want bigger, faster, stronger, cheaper. It's like all of these, these things, right? So it's the users that are continuously feeding demand into the machine manufacturers and giving them that feedback. So trying to keep a pulse on what the future looks like from machine manufacturers as well. And in the background, planning that for future iteration to products saying, okay, instead of printing four of these parts and welding them together, now I can, now I can consider having a, a larger monolithic print for this and, and trying to bake that in um, to your plans as you scale as well. So it's a, it's an ever evolving industry. So it, it you can't just go take a look at uh, where the industry is today and say, okay, I'm going to make all my plans based on the current state of the industry. It's, you have to really keep your finger on the pulse. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And uh, also the concept of that person has a machine that's this big, so I need to build mine 10 more centimeters bigger. No, I'm going to make mine 10 more centimeters. No, I'm going to make mine. And then it's like an arms race. They just keep getting bigger and bigger and then put more lasers into it. And actually, you're, by the time that you made the biggest machine, it's like as big as that helps. Why didn't you do that? You could have just done that by DED. So sometimes that's not the answer. It's like a race to incrementally increase something. Whereas this other technology over here could have actually done the job better, cheaper, but people didn't know about it. So there's some of that as well. I think as machine manufacturers, you don't want to necessarily get dragged into a race oh well let me get like 10 steps in front of you no i'm gonna get more no i'm gonna get more like when you could have done something else over here let's say laser with wire on a, on a freeform basis or something like that and so those are kind of considerations which exactly speak to your point i'm a designer i have a part i need to print it 1.2 meters in the z height Oh, but then someone else, we just did a little bit more at the 1.5 and, no, 1. 5, and then it starts becoming uncontrollable. And so I think there also should be some degree of responsibility of, hey, which direction are we going? And maybe as a community, it's better to have that conversation um, together rather than in a competitive environment where you're not really doing the best for the user, the end user, then the people who are really going to be at your mercy, at your, at your will, if you like. And just because you want to, just because you can put hundreds of lasers on a machine doesn't mean you should. So there's some degree of responsibility machine manufacturers need to take in terms of equipment, which is why, let's say, if you're a manufacturer that has multiple different techniques, those are different things that you can offer people. Don't just offer something with an IR laser. You can offer a, a green or a blue laser, a laser in the visible wavelength of, of light. So it's all different. And I think having that kind of diversity is actually quite helpful. No, I, yeah, totally I think agree. I think really- from a machine manufacturer's point of view, I think we're pretty much aligned here. More lasers isn't always the answer. And if you run the analysis down to cost per part, the benefits actually diminishes once you reach, I think, 
really six plus. And uh, yeah, I do think that customization and modularity and additive perfection become more and more important to really be, to be able to meet the demands of the different users of the technology. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Elliot, on, on the machines. Like we've been tracking it over the last 10 years and for a while we were asking ourselves, like, why are all these engines at 25,000 pounds of thrust? It's because everybody was building in the 250 by 250 millimeter platform. And then we see all these larger engines coming out that are built for the 600 uh, millimeter platform or the 400 millimeter platform. So we're seeing some of the limitations in the rocket technology based on the machine. But I do think that a lot of that has been driven by powder bed fusion and the industry is starting to adopt a lot more of DED and other techniques. Even some of the solid state techniques, cold spray and additive friction stir deposition, not just for building these near net shaped parts, but building forgings and casting replacements, which allows us to go faster and, and cheaper as well. One thing that I don't want to lose sight of is we've talked a bit about the machine limitations. I think what we've seen is really a critical area is the post-processing side of this. I can go build a hundred parts on machines, but I still have to deep powder the parts. I have to remove them from the build plate. I have to do heat treatments on them. And we've seen that as the bottleneck sometimes, right? The EDM machine gets backed up trying to get parts off the build plate, or I don't have a a hip furnace that is big enough to do some of these parts that we're starting to produce now. And I think we have to really focus on the whole end to end life cycle too. When we talk about attitude, not just the build process, but all those decisions that we make in post-processing go into that initial design. How am I going to hold this part when I'm doing machining on it? How am I going to inspect this part? And I think there's a lot of areas that those supplemental technologies definitely need to catch up to the build process itself and the understanding of how I properly design for an additive. The DFAM is not just the build process. It's that whole end to end. And I think there's potentially even new inspection technologies or new ways that we're going to approach this that haven't even been developed yet that need to catch up with the additive build process. Yeah, that's a good point. I think another thing about that is it's not always just about DFAM. It's about DFM in general, right? Talk to your downstream others, people who are running the EDMs, people who are running the CNC machines. There's oftentimes you work with a design team, you say, okay, here's the part, but there's also an importance of, you also have the ability to print in features that can help with the downstream processes that are just there to do that as well. And to your point, from a different perspective, it's, we talk a lot about machines, but I think we're at a point in the industry too, where the hardware has far surpassed the software. So you have these very capable pieces of hardware that are state of the art, but you have to go through this kind of fragmented, this fragmented stream of taking your digital part through a bunch of different tools, depending on what material you're using for thermal simulations and, and things that you're going to do based off those thermal simulations and then back into a different software for support generation. Yeah, there's a lot of areas that, that become, become a little bit painful that are not just machine related facilities even, right? So it's like facilities is the machine that feeds the machine. It's not like machining where it's, oh, the air went out. No big deal. We'll get it back up and running. No, your air and your argon and, and your HVAC and your water chilling, it needs to be working for weeks on end sometimes without a blip. And, and I think that's maybe often overlooked as well. Yeah, really what it comes down to is, is building that ecosystem around the additive manufacturing process. And I think you mentioned it's for these ecosystem partners to work together, to partner and to together lift, lift the capabilities of the whole industry. I think in, especially in the U.S., we see a lot of private companies also pushing into the, the space industry and uh, trying to support it and add different services to it. What does that look like in, in Europe? I know there's also a very big growth trend from private companies that are pushing into space. Just in my hometown, where, where I was at least born and raised in Munich, Isar Aerospace is one of those players. What does that ecosystem look like in, in Europe? I think uh, it's fair to say a lot of the key additive machine manufacturers came from Europe. Cam, uh, yeah, yours to, to, to name only a few. 
Yeah, uh, so the, I would say the wave started here and then uh, for various reasons, the momentum has shifted elsewhere. Uh, what we are seeing in Europe is, um, we don't have the, we didn't have the same push in terms of commercial space like you, you have in the US. And I think that has driven a lot of the, the boldness in introducing new manufacturing methods. You are, you are now for relativity. They tried to do something nobody has done before to, to entirely build the launcher by additive. So I think commercial space has helped to go out of this traditional mindset that the more, more established players have. And because we didn't have that in Europe, uh, uh, we, we have a little bit of delay in seeing those new, new ways of thinking, new ways of manufacturing, new ways of designing parts, etc. We are catching up because we understand how you guys are succeeding. We saw the, the plight of Starship yesterday. Uh, and our leaders are, are, are slowly waking up to the fact that these new ways of doing things uh, can be very helpful for innovation and in the end, very helpful for profitability, cost, performance, etc. Uh, so you, you talked about is our space. We have Rocket Factory Olds Board or their uh, new launcher manufacturers, which are commercial <coughs> and which the agencies are supporting. Uh, to, to work on their own feet the same way uh, NASA has supported SpaceX. So that is driving also a lot of innovation in terms of manufacturing, new players, new additive players. There, there's a, a swarm of small additive manufacturers, machine manufacturers who are in Europe, and there is a little bit of a Darwinian process to uh, for a few of them to emerge. Uh, but we, we are going to, to see that. And also, as Eliana said, for their sectors, uh, aviation, for example, is looking very seriously at additive, uh, people like Airbus, and uh, space is feeding into that, and space is learning from that. So I would say the revolution that we have seen in, uh, in the US, driven by commercial space, is also starting to happen here. Very interesting. Does anybody have any point of views on the, the Asia-Pacific region and, and their developments in, 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 in the space industry? I think Elio made a good point that I want to expand on a little bit more is for two decades as I've been in aerospace and really the rocket engine community, we've had our annual conferences and we chat with each other you know, about different developments, but the attitude community is really unique. And I think that as a community coming together, I think it's going to happen and we're seeing it happen, right? You go to these conferences. I know there's several of them now, but I feel like the conferences we go to, it's like a reunion. Like we're all friends. We're all buddies, people and hey, you're hugging and stuff in, in that circle of people and you're having a conversation and it's all the competitors and they're all talking to each other. And it's really unique that I think that as we toss challenges out to the industry or space industry or aviation industries, like, Hey, I need this. I see how there really is an opportunity for all these machine manufacturers or post-processing companies to have these conversations and start to standardize things more. Because I think that's one of the conversations that, that, that we talked earlier is how do we go about doing this standardization and come together as a community? And I see a lot of potential in that because it, it's just a unique community that I have not seen in other industries. Uh, that can have a downside too, that we might be feeding each other misinformation and saying how great additive is. And the traditional manufacturers are just laughing, saying, okay, let those additive guys do their thing. But I think there's that part of it is unique too, because building a culture around something is not easy in the culture and getting through some of the hesitations of using additive and everything. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen besides just the technology, right? People are part of the technology. And I think the people that are involved in additive are some of the brightest out there. And I believe that as a community, we can do this together. Yeah, I'd, I'd one... agree, Paul. Sorry, Fabian. I'd agree, but... Paul. I, love I come from the titanium world where in the spirit of cooperation for critical titanium parts on aircraft, there is 
something called the Jet QC, Jet Engine Titanium Quality Committee, that came together to openly share information on any detectable defects on materials that go into critical application for rotating parts. Why? Because there were huge disasters of when, you know, sores in things like fan discs and fan blades were resulted in people dying. And only as a result of that competitive nature was removed. So they come together of their own free will because they needed, they know that they needed to do that to work together to resolve those issues. But that only happened after a terrible disaster. So what I actually enjoy and what I am very gratified by seeing, Paul, as you mentioned, is that Active Manufacturing Committee already voluntarily taking steps to combat some of that anti-competitiveness in things like we see in the um, SAE committee or ASTM F42 committee. So the standards are being drawn. There are things like PDS that exist for traditional materials. And where is the PDS for additive materials? It's being written. And we don't have all the thousands of data points that we do in traditional worlds because let's say titanium, that's gone on for 70 years. We've been collected 70 years worth of thousands of dead points for every single titanium grade that we ever made. That doesn't exist for AR. So we have to generate those things as we go along. And so all these like organizations like Patel and so on are making those links, as you say, Paul, bringing that community together to do some of that sharing and so lessons learned and what is my best practice or I found this was really helpful. And as we see, as people change jobs and move employers, they bring those best practices with them. They bring those learnings with them. And that's very helpful and actually really useful. Yeah, all good points. It is always fun to go to these conferences. It's like you said, Paul, there's pros and cons. One, we're in this echo chamber and we just talk to each other. Either everything is great or everything is super bad. It seems to be the, the middle ground sometimes is, uh, is missing. Uh, but overall, it's, it's, it's definitely a community that, that I think works together well. Uh, I could probably talk more about the successes uh, of applications. I think that's something we sometimes lack in the additive manufacturing industry is users talking about their accomplishments and additive and showing the rest of the world what's truly possible. But Thank one last you. thing that's before we wrap up here that I think is very near and dear to your heart, Paul, is, is really fostering education around, around additive manufacturing. How can we together make sure that engineers and technicians that are leaving schools and colleges and universities are equipped to enter this industry with, with additive manufacturing in mind? Yeah, no, that's definitely a, a great topic on this. And I think. NASA is central to a lot of this in regards that we want to inspire the next generation. And I think being able to see rocket engine test and Artemis uh, SLS launch and some of the different missions, James Webb space telescope, right? We can all come together no matter where you are in the world. And for a moment, just forget about what's going on and just Think about what is out there, right? You see these fantastic images from James Webb, and we all see the same thing and may have different views of what is beyond Earth itself. Obviously, that's a bit deep on that, but I think we can start with inspiring some of the high school students and even elementary school students. My kids who are elementary school age, I talk to them about 3D printers in physics and they understand like how a 3D printers work. And they've even gotten to print their own parts. And it's fascinating to them that they can create something from nothing on this. So I think trying to get more printers in schools and just showing some of the students just applications of it. Here's what you can do, right? You can make your own toys on this. Or when you get to the university level, I think that industry and government agencies need to stay really engaged with the research because there's a lot of things that we don't know about additive. And NASA tried to sponsor a lot of masters and PhD students on these topics that we need data for. And 
we need this critical data. So we have the students go develop the data and then we use it in our everyday work. So I think there's a lot of opportunities there and just having those conversations with the community and more publicity around traditional manufacturing and additive manufacturing. Yeah. I think it's one of the, the, the key drivers of, of future growth that we really need to work on. And the manufacturing alone has, I say there's a lot, 500,000 open jobs today in the U.S. alone. I'm sure it doesn't look very different in European Union. We're working on bringing capacity back to the, to, to all of our countries really, but yeah, we need some people to do the work. So if we can inspire people to get back into manufacturing, and I think space is a great driver to excite people to bring it back. I'm sure that we can accomplish that mission. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here. This was a really awesome discussion. Thank you all for being on the show. I, I had a great time today. All right. And also a very big thank you to you out there, to our listeners. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Stay tuned for next week's episode where we have another set of uh, fun guests. If you like this episode, if you learned something, please feel free to share, subscribe, whether if it's your favorite podcast platform or YouTube. And I'm Fabian Alefeld, and I will see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>